Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Polero Maza webinar on pre-award protest and underutilized tool. Today, um, I'm here. Hi, I'm Michelle Lidikin. I'm an associate in our government contracts group, and I'm joined by my colleague, Timothy Valley. Hi, everyone. So as you may know, Polero Mazza is a full service law firm. In addition to doing bid protests and other government contracting issues, we also work on small business programs and advisory services, labor and employment, business and corporate litigation and IP issues. So if you have any questions and you think you may need a lawyer, reach out to us and we can help you or find someone who can help you. So moving on to our topic today. These are the, the top the subjects we will cover in our discussion of pre-award bid protests. We'll start off with what is a pre-award protest, other strategies uh, as alternatives to filing a protest, deciding the protest, potential protest arguments, the protest process, available relief, and recent developments. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but as you'll see, you can ask questions uh, through the GoToWebinar app, and we'll do our best to answer those as we go. So feel free to submit questions. And any questions we don't have time to get to during the presentation, we can follow up with you via email afterwards. So we're going to begin with what is a pre-award protest? So what is a pre-award protest? At its, at its most General, it's a challenge to the ground rules for procurement before proposals are due. And this is an important concept that we're going to stress throughout the webinar because these arguments that we're going to talk about today, if you don't bring them in a pre-award protest, they generally are going to be untimely if they're brought after award. So it's important to bring them at the right time. And many contractors don't consider the importance of that or in reviewing terms that they say, uh, they, these look problematic, you know, we'll just protest it later or we'll, or we'll deal with it down the line. Uh, again, it's important to deal with these upfront prior to proposal submission as we'll detail later. Um, as for relief in a pre-award protest, it's often going to be corrective action, which means the agency will respond to the protest, let GAO know that they're going to take corrective action, and typically uh, amend the solicitation or amend the terms that are problematic as raised in the protest. Um, and that usually includes some extra time to submit a proposal, which could be a benefit. Uh, again, we'll go into everything in more detail. Um, and relatedly, though we're not going to go into this, you can also challenge a NAICS code designation but that's a different procedure that we're not covering today. So before going into the protest process, though, there are other tactics or other things that contractors can consider before they file a formal pre-award protest. Uh, and ultimately, it comes down to communications with the agency. Um, but for our purposes, you should know and always keep in mind that pre-award protests aren't your only option. So you can do solicitation uh, question and answers and letters to the contracting officer. Um, both of these processes, whether it's a Q&A or a letter, and we're going to start with Q&A, uh, this process has to occur before proposals are due. Uh, regarding Q&A, this, as the slide says, is a great opportunity as a contractor, as the experts in this field, to raise questions with the agencies about the requirements, about the contract clauses, about anything that seems unclear. Uh, it's a time for you to not just ask a question, but maybe explain what would happen if they kept this term in place. And these questions can kind of put the agency um, or make the agency aware of issues that they might not have spotted, they might have copied from a different solicitation when they were drafting this. Things just, you know, agencies 
there, they have human beings creating these solicitations and mistakes happen. So it's, it's your chance to really get in there and have them fix these things. And, and the agencies understand this and they want these questions. And so it's a good chance for you to do that. Now, alternatively, you can also use questions and answers to limit competition. Um, one example is asking the agency to ask for a task order recertification or ask for more certifications or capabilities, which is something that you often see in questions and answers from contractors trying to limit competition, which you can then ask more questions about or um, send a letter about. So alternatively, if Q&A fails or you don't have time to do Q&A or the solicitation doesn't allow it, you can always just send a letter to the um, agency. Uh, it should go to the contracting officer. It can be from you. You can have someone else send it on your behalf, such as your lawyers. And it can be anywhere from the level of complexity of a protest or it could be a simple email saying, here's A, B, and C that we would like changed. And you can also, and this is important, you can copy stakeholders on the letter. So if you want to include the administrative CO or SBA representatives or someone else that you know is on your side, um, that's important. And as you'll see later in one of the cases we'll discuss, Letters, if they request relief and meet the GAO standards, can actually constitute a protest. Um, so what you want to do in these letters is, you know, narrow it to an issue, explain the issue, and then ask for some relief. And typically that also includes moving out a deadline. And I'll say the deadline is important because if you're if you are set on protesting, if you're not happy with the response to the letter, you want enough time to get your team together to prepare the protest and get it filed before proposals go in. So that's why it's always a good idea to set a deadline. So to protest or not to protest? We lawyers always like to protest, but you know we we recognize that sometimes it may not be the best idea. So. Deciding when to protest. You must be an interested party. Most times that would be a prime offeror. It usually is not a subcontractor. The exception there would be if there is some kind of requirement in the solicitation that is preventing you from being an offeror and but for that re requirement um, you would be eligible, then you would have standing to protest. So once you determine whether you're an interested party, the next step is to assess the arguments. You want to make sure you have factual support, the, the solicitation actually says what you think it says, and legal authority. For, for this, you do not want to be just disagreeing with the agency. Maybe it's requiring five past performance references and you think three would work better. You, you want more uh, support for it, and we'll talk through some of those potential arguments, but there is you know, case law saying this type of requirement is unduly restrictive or this type of provision shouldn't be included. And to the extent that case law or FAR provisions are out there, you want to cite, you want those to be there, you want to cite them in your protest to really persuade the agency to change course. And then finally, you want to assess your competitive position, customer relations, teammates, if you're the incumbent protesting, may give you additional time to perform because it may extend the procurement. At the same time, it may kind of antagonize your customer and, you know, give some bad feelings there. So and just like on a post-award protest, you just need to look at whether this is the right opportunity to protest. When to protest. As Tim said, it needs to be before award. If you try to challenge an RFP term after award, you're probably going to be found untimely. And you want to make sure that proposal goes in before the deadline for proposals. And as we say here, check the time zone. And then finally, it's always a good idea to submit a proposal because that preserves your status as an interested party. And it also ensures that depending on what the relief from the protest is, you'll be included in the zone of offerors who are afforded that relief. So if the agency says, hey, you're right, 
we're going to amend the RFP and let people submit revised proposals, but not let people submit new proposals. You want your proposal to be in that pool so you get to revise it. And my final point here is when you submit your proposal, if you're challenging one requirement, you want to make sure that your proposal complies with all of the other requirements because you want to be able to say, hey, but for this requirement, we would be eligible for award. And a key consideration in timing are ambiguities in the solicitation. There are latent ambiguities and there are patent ambiguities. A latent ambiguity is the kind of ambiguity that is not apparent from the face of the RFP. It only becomes clear that there is an ambiguity after the agency has done its evaluation and made its award decision. So this is, it's a difficult concept to understand, but one example is there was an RFP where an offeror was required to provide information about three projects, and the, the RFP said two of them must be from the prime. And then additional section of the RFP said the offeror list of past performance should in, include a project where the offeror was a sub or may include a project where the offer was a sub. So then there was a company that submitted three projects. Two were from its sub, which the sub had performed as a prime. And one, the third past performance reference came from the prime offer itself. And the agency didn't consider both of the ones submitted on behalf of the sub, saying, no, we, we were only taking one from a sub. And the offeror went to GAO and protested. And GAO looked at the RFP language and looked at the interpretations advanced by both parties and said, no, we think this could be read both ways. Your solicitation wasn't clear, but it wasn't, it wasn't obvious that it wasn't clear until after you reviewed their proposal and didn't consider these two past performance references. So that's a latent ambiguity, and that kind of thing can be raised post-award. A patent ambiguity is a type of ambiguity that is obvious from a review of the solicitation just on its face. It may be that one section of the past performance evaluation factor says you're going to have five years of past performance looked at, and another section says three. That's an obvious ambiguity, and that kind of ambiguity needs to be challenged or questioned before proposals go in. And then you have to decide where to protest. You can go to the contracting officer, also known as agency level. You can go to the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, or if you're working with the FAA, they have their own forum, which is called ODRA. Okay. The first option is protesting to the contracting officer. Here, as you can see, relatively low cost, you may get prompt corrective action, you may be able to negotiate with the contracting officer, there's a quick turnaround, 35 days is what's called for, and no one's going to be intervening, because no one will really know that you filed the protest unless the agency shares it. I'll also say sometimes the contracting officer protest is seen as less adversarial, because GAO, you're bringing in a third party, and it just gets a little more contentious sometimes. The disadvantages are that you don't have that review from an outside neutral party, and you're not likely to get discovery, so you won't be able to see any draft solicitations or the market research or RFIs or anything the agency did to help it shape the requirements that you're challenging. So the, pro the process for protesting to the CO is you file the protests, there's an automatic stay of award. The agency can move forward with evaluating the proposals it received, but it can't make award until the protest is resolved. Uh, there are general rules in the FAR. Some agencies have their own procedures or they'll be in the solicitation, so you want to check those and make sure you comply with them. You await the decision, and then if you get an unfavorable decision, you can seek a higher level of review within the agency or file with the GAO or the court. And if you go to the GAO, the agency may choose to end the stay or it may choose to extend it depending on the facts of your particular protest. 
And if you choose to protest at the GAO, the advantages are, again, a relatively quick resolution. I know some of you might be thinking 100 days is not a short turnaround when you want to get these proposals in and get some work done, but 100 days is pretty short. Um, litigation can take years, so that's why we say relatively quick resolution. Um, if you file it pursuant to the regs and it's, it's timely, you can get an automatic stay of contract award, which means that the agency is not going to give an award to anyone that submitted a proposal, including you, but then what will happen is if you get corrective action, uh, you might get to submit a new proposal, you might get more time to review your, your proposals. Um, and because it's pre-award, and that's what we're talking about, you know, in my opinion, I think the agency has uh, more of a chance of using corrective action and noting when there's just a blatantly erroneous term in a solicitation to take corrective action, which will shorten that 100 days even more. Um, the disadvantages, however, GAO is not a court, um, so there's a question as to whether there's less scrutiny on the agencies. Um, it's, you know, there's no definitive answer to that. There's also a narrow jurisdiction, and they've analyzed GAO decisions over the years, so the statistics are decidedly against the protesters, meaning it's highly unlikely that you'll get a sustain, um, but that also, you know, I won't go too much into the details on this, but you have to also understand that there are corrective actions that take place that aren't considered sustains, and that's a higher number. As for the process, it, of course, starts with filing a protest. This would happen after any Q&A or letters. Um, then you would, the next day, you would file redactions, which would be a, a public version of your protest. You would redact any confidential information. You, if you file it, uh, within the times to seek a stay of award or performance, and GAO alerts the agency on time, then the, the award is stayed. You would then check acknowledgement to make sure that GAO alerted the agency about the protest so that the agency then puts that stay in place. We would file protective order applications so that anything that was submitted in the protest and anything that the agency produces in its agency report um, would be protected. Then the agency report would come out. Before that, though, there is a letter of what the agency intends to produce, and we would review that and maybe go back and forth with the agency as to what it should produce. Um, the agency will resist producing relevant documents, so there's a little battle there. Once the agency report is finalized, that's your chance to review it, uh, or for us to review it, and then we have to submit comments, which is analysis of the um, report based on our protest arguments, and it's also a time if we review the report and find other supplemental protest grounds, it's our time to do that as well, and that has to happen within 10 days of, the, of receiving the agency report. Following that, the GAO might ask for a hearing um, or a teleconference with the parties. Uh, following that, you then get the GAO decision, and then after that, you do redactions, and then you'd have to destroy all the protected materials. And as Tim said, there is a possibility for corrective action pretty much at any time after the protest is filed. Uh, this is just a graphic showing that process, which I just, I just described. The one thing I didn't mention was sometimes the agency, or if there's an intervener, might request for the protest to be dismissed, which would typically happen before the agency record. Um, and this one just kind of details the deadlines that the agencies and the protesters have. Uh, and it also discusses redactions. The other venue where you could protest is the Court of Federal Claims. Uh, this one has some distinct advantages, such as the right to appeal uh, the court's decision to the Federal Circuit. Uh, the court has a much more rigorous review, um, and the agency report, unlike at GAO where you might be fighting over what's produced, the agency typically produces the entire agency report for you to have and for the court to review. Uh, disadvantages are there's no automatic stay of award like there is at GAO. You'd have to file a TRO or a motion for preliminary injunction. Uh, COFC cases are also very time consuming um, based on the filing requirements and as a result they're much more expensive than a GAO protest. 
COC as a court uh, comes with it, the process as you file a complaint and, as I said, a, potentially a TRO if you're looking to get what would be the equivalent of a stay. Uh, there's also a protective order here. The court will often have hearings. You would then file a motion for judgment on the administrative record after it's produced. The other side would have a chance to respond. The court might then have more hearings and oral arguments. And then when the court wants to do it, uh, it makes its decision. It could be two months. It could be a year. Um, like I said, it's more time consuming and there's, there's really no impetus for the court to do it, whereas GAO has a 100-day deadline that it likes to meet. In the pre-award context, the government will often advise the court of when, if it particularly needs to turn over the contract, it will advise the court, and the court does try to usually work with those needs, but it can take a long time. And there, of course, can be corrective action from the agency because they also have to go through this onerous process. So our next topic, uh, potential pre-award protest arguments. And I'll say we've already gotten uh, one question on this kind of issue that says, but during the course of a procurement, there may be a competitive range. And then if you're eliminated from the competitive range, you get a debriefing. How does that differ from today's topic? It's actually part of today's topic and will be uh, it'll be featured on one of the slides. Uh, elimination from a procurement uh, in the midstream, we'll say, from the competitive range, you often make the same type of arguments you would make in a post-award context because you have found out how you were evaluated. So you wouldn't be making the same types of arguments about the RFP, but it would have a similar impact that while that competitive range protest is pending, the agency cannot make award. It can continue to evaluate the other offerors that are in the competitive range, but it needs to deal with your protest. So for that reason, we often see corrective action in competitive range protests because it's just easier for the agency to let that protester back in and move forward. Um, but so a competitive range protest is a pre-award protest, but it makes a lot of the arguments you would make in a post-award protest because it's about the evaluation. As for improprieties in the solicitation, this is a really broad term. It could as you can see that there's a whole host of arguments you can make. Are, they, are the terms unduly restrictive of competition? Are the terms unclear or conflicting? Um, did, the, did the agency fail to include or did it impermissibly exclude required clauses and provisions? Um, is the evaluation method unreasonable? Is, or is there insufficient information? So, if, you know, some real life examples of this. Um, DOD has specific intellectual property clauses. Did they include the right clause? Did they include a clause that they made up and that doesn't even come from the DFARS? Um, did a civilian agency use an incorrect or outdated contract clause that maybe has just been pulled over from an older solicitation? Um, is there impermissible limitations on free speech or other activities that are constitutionally protected? Uh, one. You know, another example is uh, the three-year limitations on review of CPARs. So this might be one where you have three years of good CPARs, but the solicitation calls for five years. You could protest that. Now, this is one where it might be to your advantage to include four years because all of your CPARs are great. Um, and it could be that your the other potential offerors might have four years of CPARs and not be as great even though the three years are good. So again, these are things that you have to uh, submit a pre-award protest. So if you don't, you're stuck with them. And what Tim is referring to there is the FAR has a provision that specifies that when uh, looking at past performance, it's three years that's really the relevant period of time. But agencies often put five years, seven years, other periods of time. So the protest there would be to say this provision that's calling for five years of CPARs is inconsistent with the FAR. So some other potential protest grounds are small business issues. If a contract has not been set aside and you believe there are two small businesses, you could file a protest saying the agency has not followed the rule of two or the agency has not gone through the right hierarchy of set-aside programs. There's actually in the FAR mandatory source provisions and 
you could also argue that the agency should have gone to a different mandatory source, like the federal supply schedule. Exclusion from competitive range, which we touched on a moment earlier. Last minute amendments, there's case law that the government can't issue a material amendment, you know, a day or two before award. So if they've suddenly added a whole bunch of requirements or put limitations on subcontracting or something like that, that could be protested. Improper cancellation of a solicitation can be protested. I'll say agencies have a fair amount of discretion in canceling an RFP. Here you want the winning arguments or there's some kind of bad faith behind it or the agency failed to engage in proper advance planning. Lastly, there will often be issues related to OCIs that should be protested before award. One example would be if you believe there is an offeror that has an OCI and the agency isn't requiring mitigation plans or anything, that would be protestable. Or if the agency has put some kind of blanket restriction on a group of companies or name specific companies that is deemed ineligible because of an OCI, that could be protestable because a FAR, FAR requires offerors to have an opportunity to mitigate in a, a potential OCI before being excluded. And now we will uh, move on to the topic of available relief. So uh, as we've said throughout, corrective action is a common form of relief. Corrective action is voluntary action by the agency. Most times the agency will tailor or its actions will be responsive to some of the protest arguments. So if you've challenged a particular aspect of the solicitation, they'll probably amend the solicitation to fix that issue, remove or revise that challenge provision, and then usually give more time to submit proposals because now that the rules have been changed, you need an opportunity to address that in your proposal. The only time where you get attorney's fees after when after corrective action is when an agency unduly delays taking corrective action. And the general rule is an, un, an agency unduly delays taking corrective action if it waits until after it produces the agency report to take corrective action. So if an agency takes corrective action within that first 30 days after you filed your protest, you're unlikely to get attorney's fees. What does a win mean? So that, that really depends on what your protest grounds are. Uh, a corrective action, as we said, could be a win, and then you may get these, the revised terms, more time to submit your proposal, may get attorney's fees if you're at the GAO. At the COFC, it's more difficult to recover attorney's fees. Now, again, a sustain is also possible. It could be that, you know, the agency fights this to the end and the court or the judge says, agency, you're wrong, go fix your solicitation. That would definitely be a win. And then you may get bid and proposal costs. That most happens if an uh, uh, RFP has been canceled because then you've spent all this time and effort and you don't have the opportunity to actually get anything out of the contract. And now we will talk about some recent developments in uh, the pre-award bid protest world. And then we will uh, answer the questions that have been coming in. So the big change that we're still adapting to happen with GAO and they've moved from this email filing to an electronic filing system. It's the electronic protest docketing system. You we have to create account before filing. Now all protest filings are submitted via EPDS and GAO communicates through nifty little comment bubbles through EPDS and it is now a docket like you would see with a court case. Um, it's pretty convenient. Uh, the only thing that comes with this, however, is a $350 filing fee that um, didn't exist before. So you used, to, you used to just file a protest via email. You'd send it to GAO. You'd call them up. Um, now, because they have the system, they unfortunately have a $350 filing fee. But it does come with a lot of streamlined procedures and uh, generally has been well received. So the other big changes are task order jurisdiction. Uh, if you're going to challenge the term of a task order, um, you the task order must exceed, for civilian agencies, $10 million. And for DOD, NASA, and USCG, 
it, it, mu it must exceed $25 million. If you are on a task order and it's below those limits, you cannot challenge that task order unless the value limit does not apply um, because you're challenging the task order for exceeding the scope, period, or value of the master contract. So that would be the IDIQ or the MAC or the GWAC. Um, jurisdiction is also limited to GAO in that you cannot protest a task order at the CUFC or with the agency slash contracting officer. Um, notably, this does not apply to task orders under the federal supply schedule, most often seen with GSA contracts. Um, if you're below the dollar threshold, however, you can protest the task order ombudsman for what that's worth. Um, so in a recent decision, and, and this is a great decision to kind of show a bunch of the stuff we've been talking about today. So this, under this procurement, Office Design Group protested at GAO, um, saying that the agency, uh, in one of their amendments, created an ambiguity in the solicitation and that it happened too soon to the proposal due date. GAO sustained the protest and found that the agency in its second amendment created a patent ambiguity relating to um, its removal of a VA clause regarding the notice of SDVOSB set-asides. Um, and the ambiguity comes in because on the, on the SF1449 block 10, uh, the agency checked off as SDVOSB but then they removed the clause that pretty much enforced that SDVOSB set aside. Um, so they said that was a patent ambiguity. Now, this is also an interesting protest because the protester had initially sent a letter asking for relief and GAO considered that letter to be a protest. So when the agency finally gave its decision based on that letter, the proposal deadline had passed. And there's a loophole to the general rule we've been talking about, which is if you file an agency level protest and the agency issues its decision after proposals are due, then it's still timely and you can still protest the uh, terms as if it were a normal pre-award protest. Okay, and then we have this case from the end of last year, Global Super Tanker Services. And this is helpful for showing an unduly restrictive requirement. The solicitation required the maximum tank size for these aircraft to be 5,000 gallons. The protester argued that wasn't necessary. It wasn't, you know, needed to accomplish the objective of the RFP. And GAO agreed. They went through all the evidence the agency put forward and said, no, this is unduly restrictive of competition. You can't do this amend your RFP and let other people bid. And then our final decision is Pitney Bowes, also an unduly restrictive argument. Here, the protester argued that by imposing these requirements to have a high capacity sheet feeder that was capable of being loaded on the fly and having folders and inserters with a specified capacity and ones that could handle all types of envelopes, the agency was basically creating a de facto sole source because only one company had a kind of equipment that met all those specifications and none of those specifications were actually necessary to accomplish what the agency wanted. And JO agreed that there wasn't a reasonable justification to have all of these requirements and you could accomplish the objective of the RFP with other similar equipment that didn't quite have all of these specific bells and whistles. Okay, and now we have time for some q and I see a bunch have come in. Um, one, the first one we'll talk about is, can you protest the solicitation structure? For example, if you think it should be an IFB or an RFP, and then relatedly, someone has asked if you could protest the use of an LPTA. And here, you can, I mean, I'll say you can protest most of anything. A strong, but a strong, oops, question. A stronger protest argument is you want to make sure you have some legal authority for you. So if you're going to argue that it should have been an IFB or an RFP, you want 
there to be ideally a FAR provision that speaks to this issue and says this is when an IFB should be used, this is when an RFP should be used, and then say because of this, the nuances of this procurement, this is why it's wrong here. People have protested LPTA, and I've not seen any time where that has been successful. So um, I wouldn't recommend that, although, you know, you never know. There's always maybe a case where it would be appropriate. That's the kind of thing where maybe a Q&A or a letter, you know, more informally explaining why for this type of work, you really don't want to be focusing on the price. You want to be focusing on the quality of the people, the resources, et cetera. Maybe you'll be able to shape the, the agency's thinking on that. And then, at, we, we, as you know, we talked about this three-year provision in the FAR about past performance. I don't have that site off my hand, but it should be in FAR 15.12. Um, we can follow up with you afterwards about the exact uh, provision we're addressing. And I, there are cases holding it's permissible. This is the kind of argument you can present and, once again, show why it's not appropriate in this case to be looking back three years. Say the agency hasn't shown why it needs to look back five years or seven years or however, many it's look, however far it's looking back and you know, show why for this particular procurement the three years is what should be used. Someone has asked, how would a contractor know what the evaluation method was used when the COs do not share how RFPs are evaluated? If the question is about the evaluation method in, for a procurement, that should be in the solicitation. Uh, in terms of knowing how your proposal was evaluated in a post-award, a debrief, you're entitled to either a debriefing or a brief explanation of award that would give you that information. In the competitive range context, an agency is allowed to wait until after award is made to give you your debriefing, and then you have the right to protest then. But you don't want to wait until you get your, until after award to request that debriefing in the competitive range context. If you have a different question in mind, a uh, person who asked this question, feel free to submit another question or send us an email. Our email addresses are on this slide, and uh, we can try to ex explain what it, the, uh, the question to you. So we've gotten a question that um, agencies during Q&A um, before, before the proposal due date will often provide unresponsive vague or contradictory answers. So this Q&A process creates more ambiguity. Uh, it can be frustrating. And can this be a, the subject of a letter to the CO and a basis for relief? Um, absolutely. This, these are things that you can absolutely bring up in a letter. Um, one thing we might not have mentioned is the Q&A is often integrated into the solicitation as if it's a term of the solicitation. Right. So. Q&A is legally an amendment to the RFP, just to clarify. If something is put in writing by the CO and given to all offerors, it's an amendment to the RFP. Right. And so that's why you definitely want to send a letter or protest that. And that paper trail can actually be helpful in a protest or a letter showing, like, hey, we tried to get clarification and you only muddied the water more. Um, and, you know, to when you file that agency level protest, it may go to agency counsel and they'll look at it and say, what are you guys doing? Like you screwed this whole thing up or, you know, be able to provide some clarity. Same thing at GAO. They'll see that, you know, you tried to clarify this issue and were unsuccessful. This can also be double edged because if there are Q&A that address an issue that you're trying to raise, but the agency has already addressed it in Q&A, but you didn't read it, that can hurt you. Yeah, it's always good to review the Q&A and make sure you're aware of any clarifications. Uh, we often do that before filing a post-award protest to make sure that whatever ambiguity we're arguing is there wasn't uh, clarified before award. Uh, we also have a question about procurements, uh, A&E procurements under the Brooks Act. Any tips or advice, warnings? I mean, really for every procurement, it comes down to what's specific in the RFP and the requirements. I know I, we do a lot of construction work around here lately, and sometimes those requirements can be confusing or be unclear. So I think it's it's helpful for construction contractors equally to get clarification 
to document all those kinds of discussions so that they have a everyone is on the same page what those requirements are. But there really aren't any specific rules or tips that would be different for that type of procurement. Yeah, I would just say read FAR Part 36. <laughs> um, just make yourself aware of it. And if issues come up, don't forget to protest them. Okay, and so we, we did clarify that comments, instructions from the agency via other formats besides a formal amendment are treated the same as an amendment. There's, there's lots of case law on that point. Okay, what time frame would be considered to a last minute amendment to a solicitation? That, uh, it really depends on the type of the amendment. If it's a relatively ministerial type change, like all you have to do is maybe they put 10 point font and they want a 12 point font, they could do that, you know, within a day or two. But if they're doing something that Imposing a change is going to make you rework your proposal, like they've eliminated a labor category or they've added a whole new scope of work, or now suddenly everyone has to have clearances, or you have to have a location within 10 miles of this government agency. The kinds of things that you would need to make substantial efforts, if that's happening more than a couple, few days before your proposals are due, that's going to be a problem. It's a very fact-specific analysis, um, so I can't, there is no firm, oh, five days is good enough, but, you know, three days isn't. It really depends on the type of amendment and change being imposed. Okay, we've got asked you to send this link, the link for the slides. We will be sending out a, uh, slides and a link to the recording uh, afterwards. You can also download it from uh, the webinar itself, so you will have a chance to, multiple chances to get these slides. Do we anticipate more protest issues or more protests with the new tiered evaluations? You know, I think in this day and age, there's a lot of factors that drive protests. Uh, some of the category management initiatives that are putting more and more things onto these schedules and IDIQs, that drives protests. The uh, consolidation of the industry, the the budget changes from year to year. There are a lot of things that impact protests. There was, I believe, an increase last year, um, and there had been a decrease in the year before. So these things really fluctuate, and I don't know, there usually isn't one single cause for a change in the number of protests. And then we have, when can letters to COs be used after the question period? You could use a letter before the Q&A. You could use a letter after the Q&A. Uh, you could use letters even when the draft RFP is issued to try to influence the terms of the final solicitation. The key is doing all these things before award. And for the CO letters and the Q&A, doing them before, far enough in advance before proposals are due that you can get together your protest. Okay, and I see we are just about out of time. So if we've not gotten to your question yet, uh, we will follow up with you via email within the next few days. Hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.